morning. Welcome, everybody. And we welcome Ian Parkinson, who's uh, Reverend Ian Parkinson, Associate Archdeacon. Welcome back. Um, just a quick notice, a, a date for your diary. 9th of July, as part of Stannington Garden Party, the scaled down uh, carnival, Underbank Art Group will be showing their artwork as in previous years. It's from 11 o'clock until 4.30. And we, the church, it'll be hosted here in church. Um, church will be serving refreshments. So um, on behalf of Michelle, I'm just saying that a notice will be going on the board for any donations of cakes and also think whether anyone would, might be free to help serve refreshments on that day between 11 and 4.30. Thank you. Oh, and any children here? Nope. Um, Forest Church will be next week, 4 o'clock. Um, it's now once a month, so just to remind you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Morning, everybody. I'm going to move a bit nearer the middle. <laughs> nearer the people. Shall we stand? The Lord be with you. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we might find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. As we come to worship, we're going to uh, sing God's praises in just a moment, but as we come before him, let's just be still before him for a moment, acknowledging that we come as those who are confident of his grace and mercy, but those who stand in need of his forgiveness. The Apostle Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one, one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Let us confess our lack of love and our need of grace as we say together, when we lose patience, when we are unkind, when we are envious, when we are rude or proud, when we are selfish or irritable, and when we will not forgive, have mercy on us, O God. Help us not to delight in evil, but to rejoice in the truth. Help us always to protect, to trust, to hope, to persevere. Then shall we see you face to face and learn to love as you love us, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing God's praises as the uh, worship group leaders.
first reading is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to the end. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came, in order that we might be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. It is through faith that all of you are God's sons in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptised into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free men, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks God. Hear the Gospel of the Lord according to Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Jesus heals a man with demons. Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Gerasa, which is across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a man from the town who had demons in him. For a long time, this man had gone without clothes and would not stay at home, but spent his time in the burial caves. When he saw Jesus, he gave a loud cry threw himself down at his feet and shouted, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus had ordered the evil spirit to go out of him. Many times it had seized him, and even though he was kept a prisoner, his hands and feet fastened with chains, he would break the chains and be driven by the demon out into the desert. Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Mob, he answered, because many demons had gone into him. The demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on a hillside. So the demons begged Jesus to let them to go into the pigs, and he let them. They went out of the man and into the pigs. The whole herd rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The men who had been taking care of the pigs saw what had happened. So they ran off and spread the news in the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the man had been cured. Then all the people from the territory asked Jesus to go away, because they were terribly afraid. So Jesus got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged Jesus, let me go with you. But Jesus sent him away, saying, go back home and tell what God has done for you. The man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. So, Father, we ask now that you would open our hearts and minds to hear and receive your word and to live more completely in the light of its truth for your glory. Amen. Would you please be seated? When, um, when my kids were teenagers, um, at least a couple of them had uh, wristbands they used to wear with the letters WW. JD on them. Some of you might have had them yourselves or had kids who had them. And of course those letters uh, stand for uh, what would Jesus do? And the idea was that you know, you'd wear it and when you're in a tricky situation or where you felt you might be compromised, that there's just a sort of reminder, let's just do what, what Jesus would do here. And um, I often used to think when I saw these uh, wristbands that it would be very good for churches to, to have them. You know, a banner at the back, what would Jesus do? Because it seems to me that our commission as the Church of Jesus Christ is to do exactly that. We are, when all said and done, the body of Christ. We are the living representation of Jesus here on earth. And our calling, our, our task, our commission 
is um, to, to be Jesus, uh, the presence of Jesus for others, and therefore to do exactly what Jesus would do in every uh, situation. This is one of Luke's great concerns, uh, and one of the reasons why he writes his gospel in the way that he does. Um, Luke um, is concerned that the church of Jesus Christ should understand its calling to be a living representation of Jesus. And so uh, the way that Luke constructs his, his gospel is that um, after sort of the introductions and um, uh, he gives a picture of Jesus, a brief account of some of his teaching. In, uh, right now uh, in Luke 8, um, uh, 7 and 8, we have a, a really condensed uh, account of the dramatic ministry of Jesus, as if Luke is saying, this is what Jesus was about, and then that's followed in Luke 9 and 10 with the commissioning of first of all the 12 apostles, and then 70 others who stand for the whole church, and it's as if Luke is saying, this is who Jesus is, and, and this is how he commissions the church, and this is what you're to be about. Um, for Luke, Jesus and his ministry serves as a model for us so that we have an understanding of what we are uh, called to be about. And so this particular narrative the, that we just had read from Luke 8, the healing of, or the, the deliverance of the man whom the Good News Bible calls mob, uh, some of us might prefer the older translation or, or a, a, a legion, um, um, Jesus heals and delivers this man and in a, a sense this stands for us this whole narrative stands for us as a real illustration of uh, a paradigm if you like of the mission and ministry of the church and i want to say three things uh, about that uh, based on this particular passage and the first is this that what we see here is jesus breaking new ground for the kingdom and the implication is therefore as the church we're always to be on the front foot always looking for the new place in which we can take the good news of Jesus. Um, I don't know if you noticed at the beginning of that reading, Jesus, verse 26, um, uh, Jesus and his disciples sailed on over to the territory of Gerasa, which is across the lake from Galilee. So, Jesus is going to the other side. So, the Sea of Galilee has... Um, uh, one shore which is basically Jewish, it's Galilee, uh, where Jesus is from, where Jesus' early ministry has taken place. It's a safe place, uh, it's full of synagogues, it's, it's uh, Jewish worshippers, it would have been home turf. People would have felt comfortable, there was a common culture. But the other side was rather different. I said at the nine o'clock, so it's a bit like Lancashire, you know, it's sort of the, the other side. Uh, and um, apologies to any Lancastrians here, you can't help it. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's over the border. Uh, it was a place which was very mixed. Uh, there were some uh, Jewish believers, but culturally it was very mixed. A lot of Gentile people there, a lot of people who wouldn't observe the Jewish holiness laws. I mean, goodness me, there were pigs on the hillside. Pigs were unclean animals for the Jews. You wouldn't have got those in Galilee. So it's all a bit dodgy over there. And I'm sure that the disciples, when Jesus said, we're going over to the other side of the lake, would have said, you don't really want to go there. Uh, um, and in fact, the, the narrative uh, before this account is, the, is, is the, uh, Jesus falling asleep in the boat when they're crossing over and this mighty storm um, uh, blows up. I'm sure the disciples would have thought, there you are, you see, we, we told you you shouldn't go there. Uh, Jesus calms the storm. When they get off the boat, the first person who comes to meet them is Legion, this uh, randomer who is, you know, wild, probably naked, living in the tombs, uh, frequently uh, has to be bound, uh, seriously uh, demon-possessed. And again, the, the, the disciples probably thought, well, this is exactly what we would have expected, you know, on this side. But the point is this, that Jesus is going into that place of darkness, that place uh, of lostness, not, you know, um, seeking thrills, but because he is the redeemer, the, the savior. He is the one who comes to set captives free. And he's coming to introduce God's kingdom to that whole new realm. He goes where there is need, if you like. Um, our instinct sometimes is to... Um, avoid the challenging places. We like the comfort. We, you know, we, we like the familiar. Um, and, uh, and yet, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to be on the front line. 
You may be aware that Luke wrote two books, his gospel, which bears his name, but also the Acts of the Apostles. He was the author of that. That's the story of the early years of the first church. And in many ways, the story of the Acts of the Apostles is, um, you remember that the, the book starts with Jesus saying to his followers, you'll be my witnesses when the Spirit comes upon you, and here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the story of the Acts of the Apostles is about the reluctance of that first church to get out of Jerusalem. Uh, it takes persecution, first of all, and then some monumental work of the Spirit to kick those disciples onwards to break new, new ground for the gospel. It, it, Luke, who himself is a Gentile, not a Jew, uh, is particularly concerned that the church understands our calling always to be breaking new ground for the gospel. And it is costly. Now, it doesn't mean that we need to go to Lancashire or to any other side of uh, a border, but it might be that there are people in our sort of orbit who are not quite like us or we don't instinctively relate to. But perhaps God has put these people in our street or in the social context in which we you know, find ourselves or in our workplaces or wherever because those are the people he wants us to reach out to. I have a friend who's a, a church leader uh, now in, in, in Bradford. Uh, Linda, um, before she was ordained, was a, a fairly high, well, very high-powered uh, senior executive in a large multinational uh, company with several thousand people uh, reporting ultimately to her. Uh, Linda came back to faith um, in her 40s and very soon uh, felt a call to ordained ministry. And uh, she described it to me and said that... Um, she always thought that she, her ministry, uh, she was planning on being um, a, a self-supporting minister, carrying on with her profession. She felt her ministry was in the boardrooms. That's really her milieu. That's where she, you know, had influence. And um, the church that she was part of in Halifax, had, uh, in company with other churches, had, had f formed a food bank in the South Familiar, uh, in the middle of, of, of Halifax. And... Uh, Linda said, you know, I, my husband was involved with this, but I just, it wasn't me. I, you know, the, 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 the people who were coming were uh, homeless people, sex workers, asylum seekers, people who, you know, in all kinds of extreme need. And she, she said, I, you know, I found a deep concern for them, but I just, but I couldn't relate to that. You know, I, my world was so different. Anyway, they began to offer uh, along with food parcels, the opportunity for people to receive prayer on a Saturday morning at the food bank. Linda said, I, I, was, I could do that. I was on the prayer ministry team at church, so I offered to help with that, in fact, to oversee it. Well, she said, we started praying with people, and people would come for prayer, and then they'd come back a couple of weeks later and say, you know you prayed about that, my landlord, well, it all got sorted out. And as people saw answers to prayer, they began to explore faith, and more and more people were coming to faith. And uh, she said, none of the churches locally could really handle these people. Uh, so we thought we needed to start something for them. Um, we didn't want to start a church, but they started something called Saturday Gathering, uh, uh, which was a hot meal on a Saturday night. We worship and prayer and a simple message. I went to preach there a few years ago. And um, basically, in the first several years, first seven years of their existence, they baptized 200 people. And there's this... Uh, the, the incredible gathering of people. It was a, the, the closest foretaste of heaven I think I've ever come. These were people who'd had real broken backgrounds, who had found new life in Christ. Um, I think 30 or 40 percent uh, of those who'd come through were now either working or volunteering or serving in a community cafe that came out of this. Linda said, we, 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 we planted a church by accident. Uh, and uh, anyway, Linda now is leading another church in Bradford with, with a, the center of Bradford in a former nightclub with a strong emphasis on the inner city poor and broken people. Now I tell that story because this was somebody who was profoundly surprised at how God used her and how God gave her an ability to go beyond you know, her own comfort zone. But that's, the, the, you know, th that's our calling, isn't it? And it's not about saying, oh, I'm, you know, I can do this. Not many of us can. But if we put ourselves in God's hands, he is able to change us from the inside out. He's able to, to uh, um, enable us to uh, fulfill the calling to be the church that breaks new ground 
for his kingdom. That's the first thing I notice about this passage. The second is this, and it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But Jesus comes to set captives free. And we sometimes, because it might be some time since we first came to experience uh, the transforming presence of Jesus, we sometimes lose sight of his uh, capacity to change lives. Jesus goes into the unholy places on the other side of the lake, not just to visit them or to affirm them there or bless them or say, well, you know, we really feel for you in your gentileness or whatever. He comes to save and deliver. He comes to set people free from the things that are gripping them. And in this particular man's case, Legion's case, um, the demons that uh, oppress him. Um, Jesus comes to us to change us, to set us free from the things that hold us back. Hold us back in terms of our walk with him. Hold us back in terms of our capacity to live the life that God intends for us. And it can be all kinds of things which keep us trapped. You know, we might not be wandering naked around the local graveyard, but it may well be that deep within, buried under the surface, are fears and anxieties, insecurities, the impact of hurts we've sustained in the past that have never really gone away and which bleed into us and, and spoil our experience of life. It may be guilt or the incapacity to forgive ourselves or to, to forgive others. Jesus comes to address these things if we will let him. He comes to offer us freedom uh, from this. I was reflecting as I was preparing over numbers of people I've encountered in my own ministry, and indeed my own experience of having, uh, of bringing before him things which have been unresolved in my own life and finding, moving into that sort of new freedom, new release, uh, which, um, that which Jesus brings. I remember a woman in a, a previous church, a young woman who came to faith, but had a horrendous battle with uh, depression and um, uh, uh, sort of oppressive feelings. And when we began to explore, um, I remember a long conversation with her, when, when, and, and the, the, the spirit prompted me to ask her about her relationship with her mother, and she just spewed out this venom. This, her mother had been quite a domineering, destructive person, but this girl had grown up with a, you know, in, in a horrendously sort of controlling environment. She said, I, I want to kill her. Uh, there was this, you know, unforgiveness within, and I remember talking to her after a while, saying, I think what you really need to do is to, is to forgive your, your mum. And she said, I can't do that. We came to the point where she prayed a prayer where she asked Jesus to give her the desire to forgive her mother. It was for her the beginning of healing as God just began to break in. I mean, they, the depression lifted almost instantly. Uh, and uh, she, from that moment onwards, she was a, just a, a glowing uh, witness to Jesus and to his transforming power. He does come to set us free. It may be that we look inside ourselves and recognize there are things that we know hold us back. He's the one who comes to set captives free. And we see his compassion and his authority, his power manifest in the way he deals with this man here. It's funny, isn't it? Because often we, uh, um, we, we see in the response of, of the demons to Jesus here, they, uh, they, they, they beg him not to send them to the place of destruction, the abyss. You know, send us out into the pigs, they say. I mean, who gave a thought about the pig farmers. Maybe the disciples thought that was just a good thing because pigs were unclean. But anyway, um, you know, there's a, almost a, you know, a fear on the, on, uh, and, and uh, there's a fear then on the part of the farmers. They want Jesus to leave their area. Uh, they're terrified at what they see. Sometimes almost the, 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 we find his authority, his presence, his power frightening. But it is good. It is uh, refining, it is purifying, it is healing. We are those who are called to make known to others the fact that Jesus is the one who comes to set captives free, who comes to restore us to all that God has for us. And uh, that's our testimony. That's what we're called to be and to do as the church. And if in any way we today are here um, with a, a, a sense of uh, still living, shall we say, under oppression from whatever it might be, 
then we, we can come to him today and offer him our own particular needs, our own particular brokenness, asking him to set us free. But the life of the church should be defined by a focus on making known to others the saving, delivering, restoring power of Jesus. What would Jesus do? He would offer new life to others. Thirdly and finally, Jesus commissions all those whose lives are touched by him. I mean, it's understandable, isn't it? At the end of the story, the man, Legion, who is now clothed and in his right mind, when he sees Jesus getting into the boat to go back, says, let me go with you. Who wouldn't want to go with Jesus, who has, you know, set uh, him free? And Jesus says, no, uh, you can't come. You go back home, verse 39, and tell what God has done for you. I mean, this is a remarkable thing, isn't it? That this is the man who has been an outcast, who has probably had very low self-esteem, has had all kinds of things going on with him. Now, not only is he restored, but he's commissioned. He has a vocation from Jesus uh, to bear witness in the place where he has been set. Um, I don't know about you, I sometimes find myself um, walking around my area where I live in Mearsbrook and praying around the streets and thinking... I'm sure there must be uh, you know, easier places to be a Christian. I'm sure that there must be more fruitful places, like Stannington, for example, or whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, sometimes our family, uh, our social group, our neighborhood just seems like the hardest place. But that's the place where we're called to be. Uh, you know, we have to believe that God has placed us in our community, in our street, with our friends, in our, in our, wherever our place of influence is for him. That's our calling, our commission. That's where he's called us to be fruitful, even if it feels inhospitable. And Jesus says to the man, you just tell your story where you are. And actually, um, when we find sometime later Jesus coming back to that area, um, we find there's a whole group of people who gather around him who uh, are beginning to follow him. So we believe that this man's testimony must have been effective. He must have drawn others to follow uh, Jesus. You go and tell people what God has done for you, says Jesus. That's our commission, simply to, in whatever way is appropriate uh, and sensitive, to let others in on the secret. So it might be that, you know, we come across people who are going through the mill. And, you know, it's... It's good in that context to be able to say, do you know what, this is hard, isn't it? But I know that when I was going through a similar situation, I just found um, the presence of Jesus very comforting and reassuring. It's, you know, that can be as simple as that. It's just telling what difference he's made to us um, so that others might be able to benefit. Jesus commissions all those who belong to him, who have been touched by him, who have something of a story to tell. And so, you know, what might it mean for each one of us and for this church to own our vocation, to testify to what Jesus has done for us? What would Jesus do? Well, I think what we, we get a pretty clear story here, uh, account here, don't we, of, of what he, he consistently does. He goes out to where people are, people who've not had an opportunity to encounter him. He goes with healing presence and power the offer of a, a different uh, kind of life. And he commissions others to join him in that. That's what he would do. And if we're the body of Christ, then that's, I think Luke would say, what should define our own life. We are those who are called by him to bear witness to all that he has done so that others might encounter him for themselves. Let's pray, shall we, as we sit. Let's just be still before him for a moment and it may be that one particular thing has resonated with us. It may be that we would long to know something more of his healing, delivering presence in some area in our own lives. Why don't we hold that before him? It may be that we would long to know afresh that sense of being commissioned, called by him to serve him we might like confidence and boldness in being able to own up to others about all that he means to us. Let's hold that before him.
thank you, Lord, that we are the body of Christ. And so we pray that you, by your Spirit now, would come and rest upon us afresh as a body of your people in this place and as individual members of it. May we know your Spirit working deeply in us, equipping us, setting us free, releasing us into the life and vocation that you have for us. We offer ourselves to you in your name. Amen. going to stand and uh, affirm our faith and trust in Jesus who calls us as we join together in the words of the creed as they appear on the screen there. We say together, I believe in God, the Almighty Father, who is the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, given birth by the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, is seated at the Father's right hand. He will return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in everlasting life. Amen. And so, shall we sit to pray together? Let us pray for the church and for the world. Let us thank God for his goodness. We thank you so much, Father, for your calling upon us to belong to you and to be belong to your body the church which bears your name and so we pray for your church throughout the world we pray Lord that you would strengthen us by your spirit that we might be bold in our witness to you and faithful in setting forth the beauty of the new life that you offer us in your son Jesus we pray especially for the church in our own uh, diocese and in our own city we pray for church leaders and especially for our bishops, Pete and Sophie. We thank you for them and pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them uh, in their calling and give them grace to lead your people wisely and well. We pray that you continue to grow your church. In our own diocese, we pray that you would renew us in our life in Christ that you would release us from all that holds us back in witness and that you would rejuvenate us, making us uh, younger, uh, both in terms of our walk with you and in terms of the age of the church. We pray that others will be drawn to you through our witness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world in which we live, in which you have set us to serve, and we ask, Lord, uh, that you would look with mercy upon your broken world. We pray especially for those uh, parts of the world where we see suffering, war, famine, and the impact of human cruelty towards others. We pray especially today for war zones, for Ukraine, for Syria, for Yemen, for other parts of the world where people suffer uh, from the violence of others. We pray you'd bring an end to war. We pray that you would um, bring to nothing the schemes of those who seek to perpetrate violence against others. We pray for wisdom for world leaders as they respond to the different crises which face us. But we pray for peace, Lord. We pray too for those um, who experience oppression at the hands of uh, brutal regimes. We pray for those who live in uncertainty in Afghanistan, for the Uyghur people uh, in uh, China, for Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, and others, Lord, who are persecuted simply because of their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. Set them free, we pray, Lord, and deliver them into the full liberty that you long for, for all those whom you have made. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community and uh, ask your blessing upon this community. We especially pray today, Father, for those who struggle in our community, those who struggle with mental health issues, those who find it hard to make ends meet and who um, are anxious because of the cost of living crisis. We pray for those without work, those without hope, those suffering from addiction. Lord, have mercy, we pray. And we pray that as people reach out to you, they might find fresh hope. We pray too for those in our community who seek to serve others. Those uh, involved in voluntary sector uh, projects. Those involved in health care or education. Those who are involved in different community groups. And we pray for ourselves too as we seek to be salt and light in this community. Bless all those, Lord, who seek to serve others. And may we be a blessing to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we lift before God those on our own hearts today uh, for whom we have a particular concern, those who are sick or suffering, those who are in particular need. In the silence, let's name them before God. Father, you are the strength of all those who put their trust in you. We pray that you would heal the sick, comfort the bereaved, strengthen the weak, bring hope to those without hope, set the captives free, and pour your grace out upon all those whom we bring before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's join our prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I'm going to stand to sing again, and uh, we're singing uh, as water to the thirsty, a reminder of all that the Lord Jesus promises to those who look to him. It's a little while since we sang this, so I'll play it all the way through. We used to sing it quite a lot. <laughs>
join together in the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Just talk among yourselves while Diana makes her way to the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All good. Uh, we're going to sing a, uh, <laughs> a great final hymn uh, in which we join our praise together. We're going to take our offering during this hymn to God be the glory. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.